Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us this um, Wednesday. Uh, my name is Irfan Nuruddin. I'm a professor at Georgetown University and director of the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council. On behalf of my colleagues here uh, in Washington, it is a real pleasure to host this conversation in partnership with our friends and colleagues at the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan in Washington. Uh, my a colleague and assistant director of the South Asia Center, Mr. Harris Samad, will be moderating the conversation, but it is my great pleasure and honor to ask Ambassador Roya Ramani to provide welcoming remarks, Your Excellency. Thank you, Mr. Nuruddin. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are sitting to, uh, right now and joining us uh, for this session. Assalamu alaikum, may peace be upon you. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the second event of the Embassy of Afghanistan's Lessons in Peace series. We are glad to be hosting today's event on Lebanon's TAIF agreement in partnership with the Atlantic Council a wonderful partner of Afghan Embassy in Washington. I want to offer a very warm thank you to the Atlantic Council for their help in organizing this very important discussion and all the great work that they are continuously doing. Furthermore, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Patricia Karam and Dr. Daniel Martin for taking this time to share their knowledge and insight with us today. Ambassador Lakhdar Brahimi, I thank you not just for joining us today, but for all the great work you have done in Afghanistan over the years. It's an honor to have you with us today. And Mr. Samad, thank you for moderating and guiding us through this conversation. For those of you who were not able to join us for our Listen in Peace event with the United States Institute of Peace last month, where we focused on Colombia's Havana process with FARC, I want to take a moment to reflect on some of the most critical lessons we have learned so far as we continue our journey to learn more about the peace processes all around the world. The first main lesson has been how critical consensus building is for securing a lasting peace. We know that peace cannot be just crafted between those who hold guns. Peace necessitates all of society coming together and working in harmony. This means involving women, not just as an issue on the table, but as a party to the negotiations. This means involving youth, the future of our nations, who must have a stake in the peace that we are forging. This means including people from all backgrounds, from every socioeconomic level, from every ethnic group, and from all corners of the country. Inclusivity is critical to durable peace. This is not just in line with our democratic values. It is a national security imperative. It is the only path to lasting security. The second main lesson is that peace processes are called proce processes because they are just that, a process. Securing a feasible settlement is just the beginning. We need to ensure we create an environment where culture of peace can be nurtured and the agreement achieved can be implemented. Negotiations may have begun in Doha 10 weeks ago, but we have been working to build peace on multiple fronts for, the, for over the past 20 years. From building up our democratic institutions to promoting economic development to increasing access to health and education. Although there is an urgent need for cessation of violence and national ceasefire, we know that the rest of the process cannot be rushed. We know that the hard work that it requires, and we are ready for it. We have been seeking peace for a long time. We have yearned for it, planned for it, and fought for it with the type of commitment that comes from knowing what is it like to live without it. The cobble of my youth was always fragrant with the heady sense 
of tulips and daisies, each flower signaling a change, the start of the school year, exams, summer vacation, and so on. It's my hope that one day the scent of fear will not overpower everything else and we will gain, we will once again have the freedom to, as the Americans say, stop and smell the roses. Soon under the healing light of compassion and perseverance, peace will bloom and I am sure that nothing could ever smell more sweet. It is my absolute pleasure to pass this off to today's wonderful panel so that they can, so that we can all begin to learn about the lessons within the Taif agreement and how we can apply them to make sure that peace is no longer just a dream for Afghans. Lessons like today's will be, bring us one step closer to making that dream a reality. I thank you all. Thank you so much, Ambassador um, Rahmani and um, Irfan for the warm introduction. And um, Ambassador, it's, it's a true honor to collaborate with you and to jointly host this event with you, as well as uh, the Embassy of Afghanistan in Washington, DC, during such a crucial moment for Afghanistan and the peace process. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Haris Samad, and I'm uh, the Assistant Director of uh, the Atlantic Council South Asia Center. And I'd like to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world to this conversation about lessons that can be learned from the 1989 Taif Agreement, which ended 15 years of civil war in Lebanon, and how they can be applied to the ongoing peace process between the Afghan government and the Taliban uh, in Doha. Joining us today is an esteemed panel of experts, uh, Mr. Uh, Lakhtar Brahimi, who among his many hats, is the former Arab League Special Envoy for Lebanon and former UN Special Envoy uh, for Afghanistan. Uh, Dr. Patricia Karam, who is the Regional Director of the Middle East and North Africa Division at the International Republican Institute. And Dr. Daniel Korstange, Associate Professor of Political Science and of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. We thank you all for lending us your time and expertise today. So, just to give a quick rundown for our viewers of how this conversation is structured. We'll start by discussing some general lessons that we can take away from the Thoth Agreement regarding the field of conflict resolution more generally. And then we'll discuss how these lessons both can and cannot be applied to the ongoing uh, peace process uh, in Doha. And then we will move on to some questions from the audience. Um, so uh, for our audience, please submit your questions through uh, the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many as we can. So to get us started, the Thaf Agreement instituted a number of religiously uh, grounded power sharing mandates. And that said, the document states that these structures were intended to be an interim arrangement of sorts, supported by the mandate that legislation would be passed down the road to amend and eventually remove the religious basis for power sharing in the government entirely. As is well documented, this never ended up happening, and the agreement makes no explicit mention of when or by what point these reforms should occur. Mr. Brahimi, given that these open-ended and originally temporary arrangements soon became permanent features of the Lebanese government, how might this case inform our thinking about power sharing agreements in general as a long-term method of conflict resolution? Um, well, good day to everyone, and thank you very much indeed for <clears throat> inviting me to participate in this discussion. Uh, I, you know, like everybody who uh, got involved in Afghanistan, I have uh, a lasting, really lifelong interest in what happens in that country. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed like everybody else to see that these uh, negotiations that have started a few weeks ago will succeed where others have not. Um, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm in fact a little bit surprised that uh, you are looking at the Taif uh, agreement. Uh, I, I think there is very, very, very little uh, to learn from it because it is very, very specific to what uh, the problems in, uh, in, in uh, Lebanon were. Uh, I think the thing to 
to, to I think what is what is terribly important to understand for any peace uh, process. Uh, the best conditions for peace process to get somewhere is for the people who are doing the fighting and their respective sponsors to agree that uh, they haven't won and that they cannot win and that they are genuinely looking for a compromise and, uh, and, and, and an agreement. That is what happened in Lebanon in 88-89. Uh, why 88 and 89? Well, because the, it was very clear that the uh, Cold War was ending and everybody was trying to get ready for the post-Cold War period. Uh, the parties in, Afghan, in, in Lebanon and also their, their, their various uh, sponsors. So the, 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 all of the factions in, inside Lebanon were ready to deal. And that is, you know, I was lucky enough to get directly involved in the process at that time, because a lot of much, much better informed, much abler people dealt with this process before and they didn't get anywhere. Uh, so the, the, the circumstances were ready for us to make a deal. Uh, we, made, uh, we made a deal uh, in, uh, and also the other thing that's different from, from, from with Afghanistan is that we actually return to what existed already. That is what we did. Uh, there was there was a you know, big hope, and also uh, a commitment uh, uh, by by the Taif Agreement that you know uh, we, are, we, are, we are going back to what existed before the civil war. Uh, as as a as you said as a temporary measure and then we will have uh, we will end this uh, uh, system that existed since 1943 which is the independence of uh, of Lebanon uh, we never got there and for you know the, ever since uh, Lebanese have been extremely critical of the type agreement but until now, they haven't been able to uh, work out something uh, different and, 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 and better. Perhaps this is enough for the beginning? Certainly, thank you. Uh, Dr. Karam, I know that you had some thoughts on this question, if you would care to jump in. Well, I mean, uh, taking into account, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Brahimi talked about there's little to learn, but I do want to sort of uh, say something about the principle of the approach, an approach that is uh, based on power sharing. And um, my reaction is just that, you know, while it's ideal to have a political system that's inclusive and sensitive um, to the diversity of uh, a country like Afghanistan, a power sharing efforts, in my view, um, may exac exacerbate and perpetuate division. So I just wanted to say a few things about that. From a procedural perspective in particular, I think enshrining divisions in, in power sharing structures is somewhat counterproductive to state building efforts. I mean, again, trying to learn from the experience of Lebanon uh, and also counterproductive to the state's survival in some ways. Uh, once you set a structure in motion, I think it becomes the norm, the reference, the fait accompli as happened in Lebanon even if it's intended to be temporary or interim, and by default, default would perpetuate itself. Um, so for me, rather than a temporary solution, there, there should be building elements that are part of the ultimate concept or the solution. And conceptually speaking, rather than procedurally, I think interim arrangements tend to satisfy the factional interests and mindsets when they tend to satisfy them, tend to reinforce them. I think of not just Lebanon, but Iraq in particular. When you think of a setup that was supposed to be inclusive, but in reality ended up catering to the factional, and the moment you have an arrangement that breaks down the composition of a nation uh, and a national identity into identifiable groups like Sunni Arabs, Shia Arabs, Kurds, I think you have effect effectively, rather than empowered them, disempowered those who aren't included. 
And I say this because in Iraq in particular, a good third, for example, of a population in Baghdad uh, were mixed marriages and uh, represented sort of the creative, progressive core of the middle class and the cosmopolitan class. And so in some ways, we shouldn't really confuse recognition of diversity with progress. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I have much more to say in that mm -hmm. part, but I leave it at that. Okay, may I jump in with a, a comment on what Patricia was uh, was suggesting here? Um, one of the things that we've noticed a lot in, in uh, studies of ethnic politics or in sectarian politics, as the case with Lebanon, um, one of the complaints is often that uh, the attempt to formalize different different structure or different group cleavages will essentially keep those cleavages in place and will force people to think about themselves as as one particular thing as opposed to all the other things they happen to be at the same time. So by and this is more of a comment about the Lebanese system, which was re reimposed uh, through the Taif Accord. But the idea that Christians have to think about themselves as Christians, uh, Sunnis have to think about themselves as Sunnis, Druze as Druze, and so forth. Um, does it, it in some senses it was it was almost obligatory since that's how people had been thinking about themselves at the time when they were coming to the table but the challenge is that as patricia was suggesting it keeps people in that mode and prevents them or makes it more difficult at any rate for them to think about themselves as something other than a member of such and such a group and so perhaps one of the challenges we have to think through uh when you apply it to other settings is that formalizing these sorts of group differences makes it more likely those group differences will perpetuate themselves into the future at least in part because the people who will subsequently be writing the rules uh, will themselves be getting into power on the basis of these groups, on the basis of those rules originally. So if you think about, um, if you, we sometimes call them ethnic entrepreneurs, you can call them whatever you like, but the politicians that win power on the basis of the rules at the time are probably going to want to perpetuate the rules that keep them in power. So to the degree you wish to um, you wish to make this a more open system or a system that can, that can adapt to changing realities and changing demographics, it's perhaps useful to think about building in those sorts of rules at the same time you're building in the uh, the groups that happen to be relevant at the time you're coming up with the agreement. Thank you, thank you. So I think that that's um, a good segue into um, the next question, which is a little bit more focused on um, the civil society uh, post-peace end. So subsequent to 1989, uh, there developed and remains a civil society watchdog community that is uh, working to obtain justice in Lebanon for uh, crimes committed uh, during the war. Dr. Karam, could you speak to the development of Lebanon civil society sector in the post uh, Thaif agreement period and how it has or has not been able to fill some of the gaps in transitional justice and accountability that remained open after 1989? And secondarily, what lessons can civil society more generally take away from the Lebanese case to be more effective in attaining transitional or supporting transitional justice? in um, a post-conflict setting. Thanks, Harris. Patricia, by the way. <laughs> um, I want to say that, the, I'll first start by saying that, um, you know, more than, um, more than 20 years after militias laid down their arms, the Lebanese today sort of live in a, in a sort of officially sanctioned amnesia that conceals memories of war and, and uh, discourages them from looking back. And the only official initiative that was conducted to establish really what happened after 1975 was a government report that was released in uh, 1992 that sort of estimated the number of victims of the war. Without a more comprehensive truth-seeking process, there was no meaningful sort of reparations program, no updated history cur curriculum, preventing even uh, uh, school kids, which is this new generation, from engaging in, in critical thinking about the multiple narratives and the, and the, the, that, that are in circulation today, as well as the potential for radicalization that remains in an environment where resentment and fear endure. So that's my first point. Secondly, there has been, so as a result, there has been very little public debate about the war, about its origins, about its consequences, and even the Syrian occupation. Many of the same leaders remain in power thanks to a sweeping amnesty law that was passed towards the end of the war, which prevents prosecuting ordinary militia members and senior politicians. My second point is that one of the most devastating consequences of this 1991 amnesty law has been really a perpetuation of a sort of culture of impunity uh, that permeates all aspects of life in Lebanon. In the absence of accountability for gross violations, 
and a selective approach to criminal justice, much, as, much of which is actually the result of political power sharing agreements. This has really robbed vic victims of justice. And the failure to hold perpetrators accountable has really eradicated civic trust in state institutions. And I say this because I'll explain in a, in a bit. So as a result, the, the militias that fought uh, have only renamed themselves as political parties, continue to rule and ruin the country, uh, like as a for-profit elite that operates in a system that really abuses every resource available. The most tragic thing about the, the civil war in itself is that it's not a tragedy in the, in the consciousness of the Lebanese. Uh, so, and then there is the current context, which is after banking crisis, uh, economic collapse, mismanaged pandemic, impunity of the political class. Um, the, the context is actually deadlocked and is dominated by one political force, which is the main power broker, Iran-backed Hezbollah. So that is leading me to the, this creates not unlike Afghanistan, a sort of cement ceiling in terms of the potential action of civil society in any regard. So in both cases, because of the limits of the state, and I think this has to do with the control that the warlords slash kleptocrats have and that Hezbollah has or, or that they exert over the state and society, the accountability drive is really limited to what is permissible or within the bounds of acceptable. And you have examples in, in, in Afghanistan as well. The one that comes to mind was the former VP, uh, 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 the general Dostrom's return to Afghanistan. So besides discrete efforts of some brave groups who are defying the status quo, as well as those who are documenting the missing and the disappeared, civil society has really sort of, uh, civil society has been, has not been capable of holding those responsible for civil war abuses accountable because those, they are part of the post-war arrangement. The only thing that civil society can do is investigate, document, and wait in some sense. Research and advocacy work has been carried out by a number of civil society groups, including victims groups, researchers, academics, on issues linked to transitional justice. They've mapped violations that occurred during the civil war, mass killings, enforced disappearances, assassinations, etc., to indicate a pattern of violence and doing analysis in the framework of international human rights and humanitarian law. In terms of lessons, there needs to be a recognition in some ways of the limitations that are in place for civil society, I mean the lessons, and of the tools that are used to perpetuate them. Much of transitional justice, and this is going back to my original point, it depends on the existence of civic trust, which is absent. And I'd like to make just a final point that to, to compare the two, uh, civil society is also accused often of being a foreign agent either of being a foreign agent or of departing from socio-religious norms. So I think in Lebanon, the former is more prevalent in Afghanistan, the latter, though some of the former happens as well due to all the foreign interference. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, what needs to happen, I think, is to underline and integrate more rights-based activism, even among solidarity-based civil groups, especially where some of this work like on women and children can be leveraged. And in some ways, the experience of Tunisia in this regard is very instructive. There's also the issue of coordination with amongst NGOs doing the same work, but not working together because of differences in orientation, religious or political belief. The point is that where rights-based culture is happening, we need to enhance it. Uh, and this should be the foundation of more accountable governments. Thank you. So thank you for that. So, so given this context where there is um, this concrete this concrete ceiling in a sense of how much civil society can do and civil society being in a role where, you know, they're supposed to be holding uh, people, institutions and uh, groups accountable, but then paradoxically, they're also a part of the system which um, may involve some of these groups. Um, I, I think that um, it would be interesting to hear uh, Dr. Korstange a little bit about your research um, on um, identity uh, and political participation in Lebanon and what lessons more generally um, we can take away from your research uh, regarding collaboration um, and peace in um, in a setting which is uh, strongly defined by sectarian conflict. 
Okay, sure. So just a little bit of background for those of you who don't know my research, which is all of you. Um, so it, uh, a lot of this work uh, deals with public opinion work, um, a, a lot of surveys and a lot of experiments in Lebanon with Lebanese citizens, but also with Syrians as well, which is uh, an interesting side bit here. Um, one of the core takeaways that I've got out of all of this research is that um, fundamentally there's a lot of Lebanese-ness, for lack of a better term, uh, underlying a lot of Lebanese uh, political behavior, but a lot of it is overshadowed by the sectarian discourse and a lot of the sectarian practice as well as the uh, clientelistic practices that are kind of part and parcel to sectarianism within Lebanon itself. So uh, more broadly, people are quite content to have religion play a guiding role in the broad ethics of government. So that should be familiar to a lot of people um, who uh, who study uh, much of the Islamic world is that very many, many people want some sort of ethical role uh, for government, uh, for religion in the context of government, but at the same time, people are very content to hew to very basic democratic principles. So there really doesn't uh, does not appear to be um, any sort of contradiction in the minds of most people within Lebanon and presumably in lots of other places that you can have religion play a role in, in public affairs. You can also have democratic practices, and there's no particular reason why you can't have both. Um, the hard part, though, is in a place like Lebanon, much of what we see as what we might what we might um, criticize as anti-democratic practices or anti-liberal practices um, or undesirable from a general sense tend to follow more from the sectarian aspect of it or the group the group politics aspect of it rather than some some uh, some sorts of differences over doctrine or over basic religious norms so a lot of the same basic ethical principles are things that, that people subscribe to across the different communities um, but those tend to take a back seat to just basic political competition between groups. And a part of the challenge there is that uh, a lot of that is, is uh, guided by what we'll call clientelistic practices or patronage based practices that keep politicians in power who are able to win over supporters um, with material benefits or side payments in a way that would be different from the sorts of um, programmatic policies we tend to like to see instead. And so the, the development of the, the electoral system and the representative system within Lebanon has tended to be really overshadowed by a lot of these clientelistic practices, uh, some, of which, um, some of which come from resources that uh, politicians can access from control of the state, but also from a lot of bankrolling that comes from abroad. So whether or not it's, um, it's Iran or Saudi Arabia or various other groups, uh, pour a lot of money in which allow politicians to maintain a hold on power without necessarily representing maybe the ideals of the people that they they claim to represent. So there's a there's a bit of a disconnect between what citizens would like to see in an ideal sense and the sorts of politicians they end up with instead. And it, it's it's not to say that this is a this is a story of saints and sinners. There are very few saints and very few sinners there. Most of them are just ordinary politicians doing what politicians do. Um, but they are responding to a system which allows them to hold power in a way that does not necessarily represent what the Lebanese as a general sense would like to see their government performing. So that's kind of a broad overview of what to think about in terms of identity politics. And that identity politics is a big feature of Lebanon, but a lot of those can be uh, can be thought of in the context of how do you get people into office. A lot of it has to do with clientelistic practices, which gets you people in, in power that are not necessarily the ideal types that many of the voters themselves would like to see. Thank you. So I, I think that in 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 the context of um, bringing these different parties um, into power, um, into the fold, also presents an interesting question. And uh, Mr. Brahimi, you um, alluded to this a little bit earlier, which is um, essentially to say that by 1989, when the Thaf Agreement was signed, the signatories uh, in Lebanon um, re or demonstrated a very strong mutual interest in ending violence and a readiness for peace. And, and there was a fairly clear sense that that the the parties were ready to negotiate and they were ready for peace. So, um, are there any notable factors which supported and catalyzed this readiness for peace amongst the parties? And what might they tell us about understanding when a conflict environment is in fact ready for a negotiated peace? Um, you know, let me just first say that uh, you know, I would not speak of religious affiliations uh, but you know religion is taken as a part of the identity but it's, it has nothing to do with practice with the practice or even of the influence of the religious elements in in, in, in any of the religions uh, either it's islam or or christ or or, or uh, whether they are muslims or christians shia or sunni and then, you know, Christian 
identity is split in 17 different uh, uh, groups. Um, about uh, holding anybody uh, responsible for all the atrocities that have taken place in, in Lebanon, that wasn't really part of the conversation, either in Taif or after Taif. Uh, for political reasons, one man only went to jail accused of all sorts of things. That is Jaja. And he has been released and he is now back as one of the main uh, players in the uh, political on the political scene in Lebanon. So that that has not been uh, uh, that has not been part of the conversation. And uh, civil society, you have wonderful organizations, uh, you know, very highly sophisticated, very representative, uh, very often not sectarian at all. But I'm afraid that their, their, their influence in the politics is very limited. And it's extremely interesting to see this uh, popular movement that has been uh, you know, going on for one year now. They are, they are completely against identity politics. They really want uh, you, you know, to jump into the 21st century, but they haven't been able to do so. They haven't been allowed to do so. Another point is that, uh, you see, of all the traditional groups and factions and so on, uh, there is one that has that, that is the youngest, the newest of them all, that is Hezbollah, uh, that is playing today the biggest, strongest role in the political life uh, of Lebanon. Uh, I'm sure that. Uh, you know, our Afghan friends will benefit from taking a look at uh, what has happened in Lebanon. Uh, and, and, and in spite of the, the huge differences of the situations between, between the, the two, between the two countries. Uh, the uh, Taif and the war. And people went in to end the war. And the idea was that, uh, you see, once you, you, you end the war, then you will allow the, uh, the, the Lebanese people to come together. They have come together uh, and then chart, chart out a new dispensation. They haven't done so. Uh, they were they were unable to move away from the system that uh, has been put together in 1943. Uh, as a matter of fact, it has become worse. You see, the, the, the for example, the division and the, the, the sharing of uh, positions in the government uh, in you know, in 1943. It was about the main positions: prime minister, president. Uh, Speaker of Parliament, uh, major ministries. Now it goes down to the drivers. You, you, you have so many drivers from that uh, faction. Why, why not uh, drivers from my faction? Uh, so you know, I, I think the system, the system has has become worse. Not, uh, and uh, you know, the, the the will of the people is is totally ignored. How is the, how are the people of Lebanon uh, going to impose their will on the leadership of these factions that are, you know, fighting one another, hating one another, but when, uh, you know, at, at, when the things come to a crunch, they are all together. You see, Hezbollah, the Christians, the, Sunnis, uh, they, they are all together in protecting the system that exists. And uh, would, would help from outside uh, be, be useful? I, I don't know if it is going to be available or not. Uh, one, one point, uh, I think, so you see, uh, uh, the, you see I think, uh, you know, I think Mrs. Akram said that uh, the, 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 the identity politics make it extremely difficult 
to move forward. Uh, this is what is uh, this is what has happened in Lebanon, and you know one year of mass demonstrations and of you know beautiful fraternity between everybody. People people in the streets don't care who is Muslim, who is Christian, who is Shia, who is Sunni, who is uh, Maronite, who is not Maronite. They don't care about that. But they haven't been able to move one 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 little step towards. Uh, you know, and, you know, not ending, at least asking the political class to, to ask questions. Or they haven't been able, you know, to, I mean, they speak all the time about all the, the stealing that has taken place, about the huge, huge corruption that has, uh, but, but uh, you know, things continue uh, as they were. Uh, from this point of view, I think, uh, I think if, if the Afghans could uh, have create a group to study what has happened in Lebanon and see how they can avoid it, that would be useful. Thank you, thank you. I, I think that that's um, actually uh, an excellent segue um, for us to shift gears and talk a little bit um, about Afghanistan um, before we move into um, taking some questions from the audience. So um, for those who are joining us um, on this call, uh, please submit your questions through uh, the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and um, we uh, will be getting to them shortly. Um, so like I said, just shifting gears a little bit, um, we spoke about civil society earlier, and I think an interesting question that is, is definitely um, relevant to the, the different context uh, in which we're operating now uh, versus um, in the context of uh, the Thaop agreement is um, social media and uh, digital campaigns. So um, Patricia, could you speak a little bit to how um, social media and di digital campaigns um, might factor uh, into um, Afghan civil society and their role in the peace process more generally in a way that uh, traditional print media would not have been able to um, in the context uh, of the Thaop Agreement? Yeah, I mean, there isn't much to say about this, except that, um, you know, the one thing we need to, to give credit, uh, to give the Afghan government credit for compared to other countries in a similar situation is sort of the media and the extent to which uh, Afghans have been able and, and Afghan civil society has been able to sort of express itself freely through social media in particular. Um, there isn't there doesn't seem to be i should say much government censorship in this regard or repercussions for stating opinions that are uh, counter sort of the main tendencies and activists are especially vocal on twitter and facebook we know that and we have many instances where uh, digital campaigns have gone viral so my only um recommendation is or my only um, addition is that these should be sort of supported and leveraged and amplified um, as ways to kind of, um, you know, let groups kind of express their concerns and, and make their voices heard in some ways. Uh, may I say something here? Please. Uh, you, you know, you, you spoke uh, earlier about uh, uh, impunity. In, in Afghanistan, the warlords wanted uh, a blanket uh, uh, decision on uh, uh, not 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 going after anybody in Bonn already. Uh, when we were in Bonn, they they said, "Can we have an amnesty?" That's the word, yeah. an amnesty for everyone who participated in the in the wars. And uh, you know, I think it's the foreigners who said no. They tried again uh, when during the the constitutional lawyers, and there again because because uh, foreigners were there and participating and so on, we we respectfully told them no, it can't be done. And as you know, the United Nations cannot participate in anything where there is a blanket uh, amnesty for past uh, past past misbehavior. But when the parliament was elected, then of course you had a sovereign parliament. Then they voted uh, a, a blanket amnesty for, for, for everyone. And at any rate, you see, the big, big question that Afghanistan has to, to learn from past experiences 
you, you can deal with these problems of uh, you know past uh, misbehavior and corruption only if you have the rule of law. The roof, rule of law requires three things: uh, uh, you know, good, well-run prisons, uh, a good, well-run police force, and most importantly, a good judicial system. And you see, in in Lebanon, uh, you, you have uh, you, know, you have a beautiful constitution, you have beautiful everything, but you don't have any of those of, of those three. And justice is not independent. So, uh, you know, I think, again, if foreigners want to help a country coming out of conflict, this is where they should concentrate, not on, uh, you know, holding elections that create more divisions than, than, than anything else. And I mean, I mean, look at Afghanistan. So uh, the creating this um, law of uh, uh, rule of law system is paramount. And I hope that uh, you know, if uh, these negotiations in Doha get somewhere, I hope that the first thing that the, the new Afghan dispensation, whatever it is, will work out is about uh, the rule of law. Thank you. Um, on, uh, on the subject of uh, foreign intervention, um, Dr. Korsange, you've, you've done some research um, on the case of foreign intervention and how it um, affected the attitudes of voters in the 2009 uh, Lebanese parliamentary election. So could you maybe give us a quick rundown of your findings from that research and perhaps shed some light on how we might interpret the support of uh, the United States, NATO and allies, both for um, the democratic process, the democratic system um, in Afghanistan, as well as its obviously pro-government position um, in the peace negotiations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the opinions um, of Afghan voters, if there is indeed a relationship there. Sure, okay, so a lot of the work that I had been doing uh, is with Lebanese, but I've done uh, work beyond that uh, that particular election. Um, the, the thing to start off with is that when we talk about foreign intervention, we I, I think we tend to project our own views of intervention onto others, onto the ordinary people we're, we're talking on behalf of. Um, uh, and the views that we tend to have here in this virtual room tend to be those of principal Democrats and that we tend to, um, we object to partisan interventions and support interventions on behalf of the democratic process. Um, but the problem is that most people aren't like that um, in practice. Um, so here's the short version of what's coming out of this research, which is that people don't object to nonpartisan intervention. They're fine with that. They don't have any major problems with nonpartisanship, um, but they, there's a there's a, a very simple story here. It's, there's nothing very surprising about this. They don't like partisan intervention on behalf of their opponents, and they're happy to rationalize partisan intervention on behalf of their own side. So in effect, what that means is that partisan intervention, one form or another, uh, effectively polarizes public opinion. So intervention by one by one outside actor on behalf of someone tends to make the, make that group's uh, supporters happy, tend to make its opponents unhappy, and vice versa. Um, and so you can think about this as a glass half full versus a glass half empty sort of problem, which is, you know, glass half empty. Why bother supporting the democratic process if we're not getting plaudits for being, you know, for being good, good citizens of the international community by supporting the democratic process? The glass half full version is simply that that's great in some senses. People aren't people are behaving the way you would expect them to or you would hope they would, which is they're not going to give people um, they're not going to be lavish in their praise of intervention on behalf of the democratic process or on behalf of the country as a whole because that's what you would hope the international community is doing um instead what it means is that there isn't going to be an impediment on the basis of public opinion towards those sorts of interventions right so to the degree that you can get a truly nonpartisan or a truly neutral intervention you're not going to find problems on the basis of public opinion barriers to that or objections on the part of of the mass public, uh, which means that it's possible for the international community to focus on the, the technical aspects that might make elections freer and fairer, uh, to focus on the technical aspects that um, political leaders or elites might care about in terms of the implementation of peace accords. So in that respect, it's great. There isn't going to be a barrier on the basis of public opinion. The challenge, of course, is that it's very hard to put forward a truly nonpartisan intervention, because even the sorts of things we tend to think of as nonpartisan 
i.e. the support for the democratic process, is a problem if the party that you yourself happen to support is not particularly a democratic party. So you can see how there are various ways that interventions can occur that are still going to be problematic from a public opinion perspective. Um, and so the, the degree to which it matters is just simply the degree to which um, the international community or outside actors can find a way to mitigate the concerns that various actors would have in terms of the degree to which their intervention upsets the balance of domestic power. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter that it's NATO doing it or that it's the United States doing other than they happen to be the ones doing it in these particular cases. The other aspect of this research is that there really isn't, to the degree I can discover, there's not really an anti-Western bias or an anti-American bias that people have for these sorts of things. They focus much more heavily on the intervention itself or the act as opposed to the actor. So the research that I've conducted would suggest that people behave the same way or react the same way to the United States doing X as they would to Canada doing X or Turkey doing X or Russia doing X. So we tend to focus on anti-Americanism because the, the United States has typically been very active in its interventions in the past, but people don't care about the America part, they care about the intervention part. And they care specifically about the degree to which it, to which it has partisan implications for their domestic struggles. Wow, that's a fantastic overview. Thank you. And, and I think as, as, you, um, as you rightly state, the, the, the more provocative question out of all of that is, what does it mean to have a truly neutral um, intervention? Is, and obviously, is that something that's possible, um, given the, the, the sort of geopolitical setup um, of, um, of our world? Um, so thank you. Um, with that, I, I would like to turn to some of the questions um, that have come in from the audience. So looks like... Um, we have one which is for um, any of our panelists, and it says, uh, could the Taliban become uh, the Hezbollah of Afghanistan, which I, I, I think is essentially to say, could they become a state within a state and then um, similar sort of function? So that's uh, for any of our panelists. Feel free to jump in. Oh, maybe Dr. Brahimi can go and then I'll follow. If you want. Up to you. Shall I go? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So uh, what I wanted to say is I'm, I might be a little bit, um, I might be a little bit provocative in my response, uh, but, uh, you know, in some sense, you know, it's linked to our, the discussion that we had before, uh, given that Ta'if led in some ways to um, the entrenchment of Hezbollah post-Ta'if post because they were one of the, entities uh, which were not disarmed for uh, a number of reasons. So, you the know, only, sorry? The only one actually. That was yes, not, yes, not, the only did. one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, that let's failed. Let's, let's. Yes, the agreement allowed the party basically to keep its military apparatus intact as a result of which it began, it began afterwards to construct its de facto state within a state. Um, so in my view, Hezbollah is as much the negation, again, I'm being provocative, the negation of Lebanon as is the Taliban for Afghanistan. And I think these negations are facts on the ground. And the dilemma is as follows. The longer you allow these types of predatory sort of armed non-state actors to exist, the more they become entrenched, ultimately negating the country. If you conflict with them, they defeat you. In both cases, they're existential threats. There is no really ready solution because if you choose to accommodate them, they will get more entrenched and acquire the ability to annihilate you. So in some ways, there's no, in as, mu as much as there's no solution within the closed system that is today, that is Lebanon today, one may see that external intervention may be the only way out. And I'm throwing this out. In Afghanistan, the answer could be and again, I'm being provocative, not to let the U.S. get out. If you take the U.S. out, Afghanistan could become Lebanon and a closed system without a U.S. presence will lead to the Taliban taking over. Uh, Mr. Brahimi, would you like? Hmm? May I add something? Please. You know, uh, Hezbollah was at its very, very start. You see, what has happened is that mm -hmm. Syria was the overlord in Lebanon for many years uh, when Taif took place had brought in Iran, and Iran constructed Hezbollah in, in uh, so Hezbollah was, was, was a small uh, entity, as a matter of fact, in 1991. And the Syrians came in with this idea that, you see, these people are fighting Israel and the occupation of South Lebanon by Israel, so leave them alone. 
And Iran has built uh, Hezbollah into a formidable force. That, that's what, that is what happened. In, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, we have got to remember that, you see, the Taliban controlled 95% of the country in 2001. Uh, they were routed out of the big cities, but nobody stopped to ask where have they gone? Where are they? What are they doing? And I think there were few timid ideas that let's see if we can reach out to the Taliban now. And they were silenced by everybody. There was unanimity. Um, Iran, Russia, the United States, uh, the, the Northern Alliance, uh, and even, even, even Karzai. Uh, no, no, Taliban are gone, so forget about them. I think that was that was a huge, a huge mistake. So the animal you are facing now in Afghanistan, the Taliban, is uh, you know the people who ruled Afghanistan, ninety five percent of the territory of Afghanistan, and they were thrown out by a foreign power, unjustly from their point of view, and who are now coming back. So you will have to deal with that. Uh, not forgetting what, what the background is. The second thing is that you see, Hezbollah has a huge support from outside of the country. Uh, they are the only faction in Lebanon that has that much support uh, in, in, uh, in Lebanon. So that, that also counts. So uh, can the Taliban, uh, you know, if if we come to an agreement where you know the agreement is not really total, like like Thai, uh, can the Taliban count on such strong outside support while everybody else does not have that support? Is is a question that you need uh, you need to ask. And then if you are telling the Taliban that the Americans are leaving in May. And the basis of this negotiation is the agreement between the Taliban and the Americans. Uh, that was I. So what, what are you telling them? What are you telling the Taliban? Uh, you are telling the Taliban, wait until May. Uh, and then, you know, you will talk to your brothers, the other Afghans, but in, in a totally different framework. Uh, so you see, all these things, uh, you know, it is easy to get into uh, for, for outside powers, even, even, in, even as strong as the United States. It is easy to get in. It is complicated to get out in the right, in the right manner. Uh, so you see the, so the, the, I think the United States and the new administration will have to think very, very seriously of what is it that they want in Afghanistan for themselves before thinking of the Afghan people, but also perhaps give a little bit of thought to what happens to, to, to the Afghans. You know, the Afghans did not invite them. Uh, they, they came in, okay, they helped a lot, uh, but you know, if they, if, if, if before they leave, they have got to give a little bit of thought to what they are going to leave behind. Okay, let me just uh, jump in very quickly to second the point that uh, uh, Lakhdar has, has raised with that uh, one of the core distinctions between Hezbollah and the Taliban is simply going to be the, the extent of foreign, uh, foreign support for Hezbollah, which probably doesn't exist in the same way for the Taliban. So that it, the, the relationship between Hezbollah and Syria was very much a marriage of convenience for, for purposes of continuing the conflict with Israel, um, although the the support coming from Iran is fairly substantial in terms of financial resources, um, whether it's from the, the government itself or perhaps from private tithing as well. So uh, Hezbollah is a lot of things, one of which is a militia, one of which is a service agency, one of which is a political party. To the degree that they can continue to draw so much, uh, so much funding from abroad, it allows them to continue to provide those services which people need. Uh, to the degree that that funding dries up or um, the support that they get from abroad uh, starts to deteriorate or starts to um, starts to, to vanish, uh, they're going to turn into a political party just like any other one. They'll win votes, they'll win seats, but they won't have nearly the same degree of clout within the system as they currently do. And a lot of that is based on their ability to fund a lot of the services that they're providing that others that other parties can't provide and that the state itself can't provide. So to the degree that the Taliban is going to look like Hezbollah, it's because they're going to get resources from elsewhere. Otherwise, they're 
perhaps they win a war, perhaps they win some elections, but they're not going to be doing it in the same way that Hezbollah does within Lebanon. Uh, if I may, one, one more point that is extremely important about Taif. You see, the, the, the elephant that was not in the room in Taif was Syria. You see, whereas practically everybody else was, was, was interested, was following what was happening in Taif, but was not interfering. Syria was, pre was, was the elephant that was not present, but was really, you know, Everybody called Syria Damascus uh, every night, every single night before the And when the agreement took place, of course, the, we had to accommodate a lot of what the Syrians want and the Lebanese did not want. And even though as soon as, you know, the, the, the Taif was put into, I mean, you know, the, the, the president that we, we elected, Renem Awad, was assassinated two weeks later. Uh, and there came a president who made a new agreement, a total new agreement uh, with, uh, with Syria. That was as much the base of what happened after that as Taif was. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, it superseded Taif. Uh, so you know, this, this, is, you see, this is also a lesson. How are you going to structure an agreement to end a civil war and build a new dispensation in, in the while a lot of people who are perhaps not inside the room have a lot of, of influence in, in what is happening. So in the case of Afghanistan, you've got to think of Iran, you've got to think of Pakistan, you've got to think of Russia, and also of uh, you know, others like India. Uh, so you know, as you, you as as you negotiate in Doha, you've got to make sure that those those forces are are, are supporting you and not uh, actually making it more difficult for you to get it to get a good deal. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, I think that we are running a little bit low on time. So to all of our panelists, again, thank you very much uh, for, your, uh, for uh, your expertise, for your time. And um, Erfan, I will pass it over to you uh, to close us out. Thank you, Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brahimi, Dr. Kostanj, Dr. Karam, and especially Her Excellency Ambassador Ramani for this opportunity to partnership with the Embassy of Afghanistan here in Washington on this very important conversation. We are cognizant, of course, that this is happening in the immediate backdrop of the Geneva Conference, the Donors Conference, and also another horrific bombing in Bamiyan, uh, at which innocent lives were once again uh, made the collateral damage of this ongoing uh, conflict. And so understanding how we come to peace to build a stable and prosperous Afghanistan is maybe the most important question for the world community, just as it has been, and we are glad and proud to play a part in that. Over the last four months, we have issued a major report on uh, how to combat illicit finance and illicit economic networks in Afghanistan as part of the anti-corruption agenda. You can find this on our website, along with a high-level conversation uh, featuring President Ashraf Ghani. And just last month, a wonderful conversation featuring First Lady Laura Bush and First Lady Rula Ghani focused on women uh, and women's rights in uh, Afghanistan. All of this is available on our webpage, and we look forward to engaging all of you, especially our esteemed panelists, in future programming at the Atlantic Council. Uh, be safe, and for those of you in America, have a very happy Thanksgiving from all of us at the South Asia Center. Thank you. <laughs>